Well, we're reading uh, this evening from Acts chapter 19 uh, and beginning at verse 23. So this is the uh, end of Paul's time in Ephesus and he's just about to leave. And then we read this. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that to this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theatre. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defence to the crowd. But when they recognised that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quietened the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Well, let's pray. Oh, Lord, our Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, you truly are the great God of the whole universe. You are our creator. By you, all things have been made. And all good things come from you. Lord, we thank you that uh, you are a God of such abundant grace and abundant blessing. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have made us in your image and that though we are sinners and have turned away from you, yet in your mercy, uh, you have sent even your own son to die that we might be redeemed and that your image might be restored in us. And Lord, we see around us such attacks on these things. But Lord, we rejoice that even as we have read, uh, 
where now is Artemis of the Ephesians? But you are the great God who continues and whose kingdom is being built throughout this world. Lord our Father, we thank you for this evening and we pray that you will be with us, that you guide us in our thinking on these issues. We pray, especially for Matthew, that you would guide and direct him, that you'd help him to bring uh, your truth to us, uh, to deepen our understanding of your will and your ways and your purposes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. Well, our speaker tonight is uh, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Roberts, the Minister of Trinity Church York, and Matthew's been there for 13 years. I think he was he worked for a year in Newcastle. And did you find a wife in Newcastle too? Uh, I found a wife from Newcastle. Ah, and right. That's, uh, but I didn't find her. I found her before I ever came to Newcastle. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just to say about the issues tonight, they're re of really great importance. And uh, we know in the Christian Institute that there are Christians who are losing their jobs because of the standard that they're taking on issues. There are churches that are losing their venues for special events, and there are businesses being sued because of their stand that they take on this, these issues. So they're very close to home. Uh, so we know about that in the Christian Institute. And uh, it's great that we meet many courageous Christians. And there's one here tonight as well who's gonna to speak to us. He's taken a great courageous stand on the whole issue of conversion therapy, um, making it very clear that the, the law is not gonna stop him preaching the gospel, uh, even if it does change to make a call, repentance, a call to repentance illegal. So we're very glad to have him. And he's got a book coming out next year addressing these sorts of issues. Uh, so uh, I only learned about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, so Matthew's gonna to speak to us now, and at the end there'll be a time for refreshments as well. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Well, it's a great privilege to be with you, um, but our great privilege is to serve the living God. So I know we've prayed already, but I'd like to pray again to commit our time to the Lord. Father God, we, we uh, praise you that you are the God who made the heavens and the earth and that uh, your son is the one and only begotten son of the one true God. Uh, and that's your Holy Spirit uh, is the one and only Holy Spirit. And that is the God who is three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You have redeemed us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son whom you love. But well, we do pray that we will understand the world in which we live uh, and the people amongst whom we live better, indeed understand ourselves better. And we pray that we'd repent of where we have worshipped idols rather than worship the one true God. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, it is a, a very great privilege to be here. Thank you very much for my invitation. Um, I'm uh, honoured to have been invited. Um, and I've been asked to speak about these topics of gender and sexuality. Um, I do not propose to spend any time really looking at uh, the biblical reasons why uh, why sex is for the marriage of one man and one woman, why marriage can only be one man and one woman, or indeed why uh, to deny one's created sex is a, a, a clear violation of the commandments, because it's just a statement of an untruth. Um, I would guess that we are uh, in this room uh, largely aware that those things are clearly established in Scripture. What I want to do is to dive a little bit deeper into what is going on in our world, because as I'm sure most of us are aware, um, the celebration of, um, uh, of various forms of immorality is not new to this culture in which we live. Um, that's a massive understatement. It is, this, it is actually pretty much a human universal in every culture. And the, the extent to which it looks to those of us um, who are in the church in the West like uh, the arrival of, of a new thing on that front is really just a measure of the, the blessings that our nation has had, of the influence of Christianity um, in the past. Um, however, there is something which is profoundly new 
in what we are experiencing um, uh, in our culture right now on the issues of gender and sexuality. Um, and, and that is, I think you can sum up by thinking about human nature. Human nature. At, at the heart of the kind of conviction that, uh, that underlies what you might call the LGBT movement, although that's actually not a, it's actually a very recent label. It's easy to forget how recently these different labels came in. Um, but whatever you want to label it as, um, is this conviction that there is no such thing as human nature. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no design to which we are required to conform. Um, that's maybe what people in the past thought, but that is exactly what Western secularism has sought to jettison. And it's been particularly vigorously pursued by the LGBT plus movement. Okay, you can't have a, a human nature. That perhaps is not too surprising. But here is the surprising feature of our current situation, is that actually the idea of a nature to which we must conform is not absent at all in this movement. Let me quote uh, Charlotte Nichols MP from the Westminster Hall debate on conversion therapy. This is March last year. Uh, she said, nobody should be subjected to that kind of assault on their identity. Being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans is not a sickness. It is a fundamental part of an individual's very identity. Now, I want us to think about what has happened there. An appeal has been made to a thing called identity. And what's more, it's not just an appeal that there is such a thing, but that there is a moral duty to conform to it. And particularly, it is a moral wickedness to dissuade anyone from conforming to it. And so that the idea that there is a, a human nature to which we must conform has not disappeared, but rather it's a different kind of nature. That, that there is a, a, a nature of every individual which is taken to be what we really are and to which we must be conformed, which is actually rather strange in a way. The issue here is all about identity. Uh, I am not in the Church of England. Those of you who are, I'm sure, will not have escaped your notice that the Bishop of Oxford just this week has, uh, or last week, re released a, um, uh, a, a booklet of his own in which he argues why the Church of England should approve of gay marriage. And the, the, the linchpin of his argument is actually the same linchpin that comes up in pretty much every argument I've read for this, which is, again, the assumption that there is an identity rooted in every individual that has nothing to do with their body, but to which they must conform in their actions and perhaps in the shape and presentation of your body. Okay, it is the issue of identity, which is the one that we need, I think, to understand if we're going to understand our world. That does seem to be something which looks very new, that identity is rooted in this somewhat mysterious idea of your sexuality or your gender as to what this thing is. Well, what I want to try and explain, therefore, is really what is going on here. And my, my uh, argument is, is really that while that is something very new in our culture, yet it is actually only one example of a universal thing in human cultures. Our sense of identity derives from whom we worship. And the issue that we are confronting and is confronting us is a, not fundamentally a moral issue. It is a religious issue. It's an issue about the worship of the self. And that's what I'm going to try and spell out for us uh, to help us to understand uh, our world uh, in which we live a little bit better. So then, how are we going to tackle this? Um, I want to start by thinking about um, who, who are we truly as human beings? What does it mean to be human? I'm sure you are uh, well aware that uh, the fundamental biblical category is that we are images of God. Um, I'm sure not, we don't all have Bibles, but I'm going to quote from time to time from the Bible. Uh, Genesis 1, 
26 to 28, foundational verses uh, in the Bible about humanity. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, uh, great tomes have been written on what it means to be the image of God. Uh, we can't deal with all of that. But what is plain is that being an image is about reflecting the glories of God. Now, we, we do that in, in various ways, and particularly we do it to various audiences. We reflect the glory of God to uh, the rest of the creation beneath us, to, uh, to the animals and the plants and the world. They, they, they see us and we look like God to them. Uh, that is the, the intention as we rule over them in God's name. Um, to one another, we are to be images of God. Um, and I think primarily, though, we are to reflect God's glory back to him. For to be human is to be a worshipper. At the heart of humanity is that we are to give our devotion uh, and our service and the love of our hearts to the God who made us for himself. And we are to express that not only in the way that we live uh, six days a week, but we are to express it in, uh, in open and direct worship and adoration um, to him. Uh, to be a worshipper of God is integral to what it means uh, to be an image. Now, it's interesting that that is, uh, that is connected straight away in Genesis to being male and female. Verse Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The most intriguing thing about that verse, which is the verse that establishes sexual differentiation amongst, uh, amongst human beings, male and female, in that verse, God himself is referred to as masculine. And uh, we cannot, of course, if we are biblical Christians, dismiss that as being an accident or unintentional. Uh, and it would be foolish to do so because, of course, God designed us as male and female to teach us about our relationship to him. God is masculine because we are the feminine in relation to him. And that receives a crystalline uh, clarity in, uh, in the New Testament when we learn that Christ is the bridegroom of the church. To be a redeemed human being is to come into a relationship with God in which we call him our husband. We call God the son, our husband because we are his bride. To be an image of God is to relate to God in the closest possible covenant relationship, which is imaged uh, in marriage, of course. So um, what we can say uh, because of all of that is that who we are is defined by who we are made to worship. That, that is the thing that defines each of us. It is the most fundamental truth about us. Now, I think it's worth saying that uh, very quickly in God's word, we can see that that's very multifaceted. Once we've said we're worshippers of God, it's not that there is no more to be said, but rather that in order to worship God, that, that introduces all sorts of richness to what it means to be human. For, I mean, the Ten Commandments are a description of, what, of how we go about worshipping God uh, all seven days of the week. And that includes things like honour your father and mother and do not commit adultery, uh, as well as all the other kind of relational commands. Don't steal, don't bear false witness. Uh, and so, uh, and so there, there are loads of aspects to who we are that kind of break out from the prism of the truth of being images of God. We are to be sons, husbands, fathers. We are to be daughters, wives, mothers, as well, of course, as being neighbours and friends, uh, and indeed, sometimes enemies, but loving our enemies. <laughs> you see, in, in all of these ways, uh, the, these are true aspects of who we are, but they all come under the truth of being images of God, worshippers of God. So I hope, therefore, that it's relatively um, non-controversial amongst Christians to say that who we really are is grounded 
in the one whom we worship. Now that's clear. Where do we go from there? What about who do we think we are? Of course, none of us is as God intended us to be. In Genesis 3, we read of the fall of mankind in which we, uh, we were ruined by our choice to reject God's commands and to embrace sin and obey the devil rather than to believe the word of God. Now, sin is a deeply multifaceted thing. But, but in Genesis 3, I think we can see very clearly in the archetypal sin um, that is committed in the garden, that one key aspect of sin is about constructing a false identity. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Um, uh, well, what I mean is, is that what the, what the serpent says to the woman is not just a lie about the fruit, nor is it even just a lie about the word of God, though it is, of course, both of those things, but it is encouraging her to believe in an entirely false account of who she is. So, the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die if you eat it, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what's, what's happened there is that she's been encouraged to, to reimagine the nature of reality, to imagine that her being is not fundamentally to be a worshipper of God, an image of God, but rather that she has some, uh, some uh, ground of her nature that does not depend upon that, that it is possible to construct a new universe in her mind uh, in which she can be like God in a way that's entirely different to being an image of God or a worshipper of God, but rather to be a replacement of God. And that, of course, is a fictitious universe. It's one that doesn't really exist. Now, what happens when she starts to believe that this is the case? Well, we're told uh, in verse 6 that, of Genesis 3, when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Just note in passing that Adam is the one who is, takes responsibility for the fall. Uh, we shouldn't believe any account that lays the fault at the foot of the woman. Um, but I won't say any more about that now. I do want to notice what happens here with desire. Central to the account of sin that the Bible gives is desire. That we want and we love the wrong things. With this newly imagined fictitious world in the mind of the woman... She looks at the fruit and sees that it is to be desired to make her wise. You see, what has happened to human nature in the fall is that we want to do what God has forbidden. And we do not want God telling us what we should be. Indeed, there is a new love that has been introduced into the human heart a new adoration, a new devotion, a new religion. And that is at the heart of what's going on in sin. It is a love for the wrong thing. Now, very quickly in the Bible, that becomes identified with uh, what are called idols. What is an idol? An idol is really a kind of solidification of our desires. Uh, it's, it's, it's creating a new God who will justify us doing what we wanted to do. Now, although there's no physical idols mentioned in Genesis 2, they appear pretty quickly uh, as the Bible goes on, uh, and they become a, a very key and important part um, of the account of the religions of the nations around Israel, to which Israel is constantly led astray. But what Paul lays his finger on in Romans chapter 1 is that what happened in, right back in the Garden of Eden is itself an idolatrous situation. So in Romans 1, uh, as Paul describes what has happened to mankind, uh, he, um, he, he puts it this way. He says, 
Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then listen now for the echoes of Genesis. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and images and creeping things. Now, do you see the tight connection Paul makes between the, the, the grasping at wisdom, wanting to be wise like God is, and making the images which are then worshipped as if they were God. Now, what's going on there? What is the, what's the dynamic? I think it's pretty simple, really. Uh, the, 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 the serpent tempts the woman to believe that she can define for herself what is good and evil. You can be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, and that's a very attractive thing for the simple human heart to want to do. The problem is, if you want to call something good, which God has called evil, you've got a problem. Because if God has called it evil, then how on earth are you ever going to say it's good and vice versa? And the answer, the simple answer to that is, is that you, you need to invent a new God. And your new God will serve the function of approving what things that you want to call good and disapproving of the things you want to call evil. Okay, that, that's what idols are for. That's their purpose, is that they are a means to redefine good and evil. Um, and, uh, and therefore, the, the connection between sin and idolatry is a very close one um, in the Bible. Um, but then here is the really interesting and really vital thing for us as Christians to grasp. You see, we invent idols to serve our requirements. That's what they're for, and yet we still worship them. We invent them to serve us, but we end up serving them. Because, you see, we are worshipping creatures. And though we may try and wriggle out of the worship of the true gods, what we always do is apply that worship to the fake gods that we have invented. And you can see that again and again in the Bible. You may be familiar in Isaiah 44 with Isaiah's uh, famous satire, really, on idolatry, where he describes the man who chops down a tree uh, and then gets, has his tree and he takes half of what he's got and makes it into firewood and, and, and cooks his dinner. And, uh, and then the other half he carves into an idol and bows down in front of it and says, you are my God. Um, and of course... Uh, uh, Isaiah has put his finger on exactly the human condition. We, we worship what we know we have created, and yet we do worship it. And then here is the kind of killer sting in the tail to that. For we are made to be images of the true God, worshippers of him. When we worship our idols, we become defined by them instead. We imagine ourselves to be identified by our idols. You find it in lots of places in the Bible. Psalm 115, those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. It's a common theme in the Bible. You worship a block of wood, you will become as intelligent as a block of wood. You worship a golden calf, you will have a neck as stiff as a golden calf. We become like our idols. Indeed, we define ourselves by our idols. Now, that is why I asked if we could have read uh, Acts 19. And um, I don't know whether you followed it earlier on, but you can see exactly the same pattern going on there with a riot in Ephesus in response to Paul's preaching of the gospel of Christ. Uh, and you have this almost comical scene where the silversmiths, the people who make the idols, gather together and say... Not only are we going to miss out on a lot of cash, but also, much more importantly, there is a danger that she, that the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may be to even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Like, we make these things and sell them, but we really do worship them. And wouldn't it be terrible if this thing that we made and worship were to be de deprived of her magnificence. 
And it goes even deeper than that. For you see, the Ephesians identify themselves by their idol. Why do they get so upset? Why do the city rush together into the theatre? Well, what do they shout without stopping for two hours? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Their sense of identity is bound up in this God whom they have invented. And if she is insulted, they are insulted. It feels like an attack on who they really are. Well, that is true, I think, in every age of the world. We're made to worship and love the one who gives us our true identity, but we worship instead something else, and from that we derive a false identity. And that, I think, is true in every religion on earth. A good example would be the word Muslim. What does Muslim mean? It means a submitter to Allah. To be a Muslim is to be identified by your devotion to Allah. And you could repeat that for every other religion on earth, couldn't you? Now, at this point, I suspect some of you are asking yourselves, what has all this got to do with sexuality and gender? Have I diverged from where we go? Well, I haven't uh, at all. Because what I I want uh, to argue is, um, uh, and to try and persuade you of, uh, is that while this is, seems like a very new thing, there's no culture on earth before that has ever spoken of sexuality and gender identity in anything like the way that our, our world in the West, at least today, has come to do so. Yet, what we are seeing in our, na- in our nation uh, and others too is, is just another species of the same thing of believing ourselves to be identified by our invented God. But our God is not the Asherah or the Baals. It is not Zeus or Jupiter or Artemis of the Ephesians. Our God in the West is not Allah. The idol of the West is the self. It is the free individual self and we have come in the west to worship the self in just the same way that the Ephesians worshipped Artemis and the ancient peoples of the Roman Empire worshipped the Roman gods and the others now that requires a little bit of that needs a little bit of unpacking as to what exactly that means Uh, how did we get here there's plenty of books written on Um, uh, on uh, sort of the the way in which Western thinking has developed on these lines. Um, uh, I think, so there's a list of recommended books. Have people got that or do I do that recommending? Um, They will be recommended afterwards. Oh, there we go. You're going to be recommending some after as well. Um, So uh, Carl Truman has written a very interesting book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And uh, which is one of the recommended books, uh, and he's written a slightly shorter one for those um, those like me who like shorter words, uh, where he takes out the long words. Uh, called Strange New World. It's a very good book, and what he does is just to, to kind of go through some of the ways in which this has grown up in Western culture. Um, uh, we, we can I haven't got time to go through it now, but but basically, it all springs out of uh, the, the great movement of rejecting Christianity that's known as the Enlightenment. Uh, that originates somewhere in the 17th century uh, and becomes a very big thing in the 18th century, um, uh, in which there is this this whole shift of thinking that reality originates from God and we inhabit it, to believing that reality originates with us. And if the word God has any meaning at all, it's because we invented him and put him there. Um, That's a very huge simplification. Um, But we can zoom in on a couple of thinkers who are particularly... Uh, particularly helpful uh, in seeing how we got here. So, for example, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, great French philosopher um, of the French Revolution, um, who who wrote a book um, that was called The Confessions, um, which was uh, a very very deliberate choice of title. At the beginning of The Confessions, he he says he's deliberately writing a book which uh, is is like no one else has ever written before. Um, and he's being extremely cheeky because he's even pinched the title from someone else before. Uh, he's pinched the title from Augustine of Hippo, who famously wrote 
um, one of the most important books in history outside the Bible, which is his book, The Confessions. If you've never read it, it's worth reading. It's about his conversion, uh, and it's great. Um, but what Rousseau does is deliberately invert what Augustine did. What Augustine wrote in his book of confessions was about his realization of the depths of his sinfulness and his need to entirely renounce his pursuit of self in order to find salvation in Christ. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the first kind of evangelical um, autobiography, really. Uh, it's a great book if you haven't read it. What Rousseau does is to say that's exactly the wrong way around. And he wrote, he wrote a book which, uh, which describes his growing realization um, that he himself really is the center of the universe. <laughs> And what's more, his growing conviction that what every person really needs to do is to make sure that you never deny yourself the fulfillment of your desires. That's the point of his book. Whereas Augustine had said that your desires are shot through with sin and you need to be redeemed by Christ. Augustine, of course, gets it straight from the Bible uh, and particularly from the works of Paul, letters of Paul. Um, uh, Rousseau it turns it on its head and says, no, your desires are not sinful. They're good and right and they must be followed because the inside you is the real you. In other words, your feelings are to be treated like gods. They are to be your deity. Rousseau didn't quite put it like that, but he got pretty close to it. And so, rather like the serpent said to the woman in the garden, you must refuse your God-given identity and instead believe where your heart takes you. That's who you really are. Now, Rousseau is only one example. He's a particularly influential one. I think when you add in the, uh, the influence of Freud in the 19th century, who, who particularly wants to argue that the real you is not just the inner you, but it is the sexual inner you. That's the thing that really defines you. Um, that, that this, this idea has been kind of working through Western society ever since, and uh, look at some of those other books to get the story in more detail. Uh, the point is that in the West, our deity has become the free self. This is who we must serve. It is our, our duty, if we would be truly human, to discern what it is that we truly are on the inside and to follow that. And most of all, we must never prevent anyone else from doing it. Now, um, what I haven't got time to do today is to try and trace the links between uh, that idea of the self and the idea of freedom. The two are very, very closely connected in Western culture. Uh, and we kind of worship our freedom and we worship the self as much the same thing. You'll have to buy my book if you want to look into that in more detail. Um, that's the only plug I'll do today. Um, uh, but here then is the thing. If it is the case that we identify ourselves by our feelings, that our feelings, that the self is the God whom we worship, then of course, then of course we will believe that our feelings are who we truly are. And that is why we've got to the point as a culture of believing that there is no more fundamental truth about a person than what we have come to call sexuality or gender identity. It's not your body that defines who you are. It's not your place in society. It's not even your birth as a human being. It is what you feel. Now, this is, I think, a, a very clear kind of direct opposite to the gospel, exactly, of course, as Rousseau intended it to be. Peter, in 1 Peter 1, says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you shall be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. A classic Christian text for understanding what Christian life is supposed to look like. But you notice, do not be conformed to the passions of your former influence. I think we have to say that in Western society, the worship of the self means that to be conformed to your passions is the prime moral duty of every human being. 
And indeed, that is exactly what the acronyms, the list of letters in LGBTQIA, whatever they all are, they stand for. Why does the list keep getting longer? Because it is just a list of our passions. And in a world where the self is God, our passions define us. Now, this explains an awful lot about the whole pride movement, the whole LGBT plus movement. It explains, as I've just alluded to, what, why there is no end to the list of letters in the acronym. Uh, if you'll forgive me mentioning Augustine of Hippo for a second time. Um, uh, Augustine of Hippo, in his book, The City of God, um, has a brilliant, devastating critique of Roman polytheism, uh, the Roman belief that there were lots of different gods. You know, and there's the, obviously there's the king of the gods, but there's a god of the sun, and you have a god of the hearth, and you have a god of the doorway, and these things. Um, and, and part of his brilliant critique is to say to the Roman pagans to whom he's writing, you don't have enough. You seem to have missed an awful lot of gods out. You've got a god of the hearth and the doorway. Where's your god of the window? Indeed, you've got one of the doorway, but no door. I think you need one of those as well. Why don't you have an extra one there? Um, and of course, it's quite satirical and, and brilliant. And of course, ultimately, entirely successful. You won't find anyone on earth, probably, who believes in the Roman gods anymore. Um, but actually, it seems very similar with, the, with the, this, the, the, the long list that's had to be replaced with the pluses because there aren't enough uh, letters to go around. It's, it's kind of doing the job for us. Uh, recently, I, I just looked uh, on the website of a pretty mainstream LGBT organization and found they listed 36 different orientations. Um, and that's quite minimal, actually, I think, compared to some. Other people have told me they found lots more else, uh, elsewhere, uh, many of which sound like entire gibberish to those who are not schooled in, uh, in this way of thinking. Uh, and of course, the BBC has famously said there's more than 100 different genders. But what is going on there? Well, it's very straightforward. If the self is God, then it has to be your feelings that say who you truly are. And when you try and look inside yourself and interrogate how you feel, there is no li limit, no end to the number of answers you can come up with. What else does it explain? I think it explains why people get so very, very upset about this issue. Now, upset even that is understatement, isn't it? We all know now that we're in a world where most, uh, most jobs can be lost by speaking wrongly on this issue. Um, and in fact, uh, probably ministers of churches are one of the few uh, it's one of the few categories of employment where you probably aren't going to lose your job for speaking out on it. So those of you who are ministers in the room, that's why you should be willing to do so, I think. Um, uh, wh wh why, is it so, wh why is it such a hot issue for the same reason that the Ephesians felt that preaching the gospel was a hot issue in Ephesus? Not just that people lose money, although we probably shouldn't discount that sometimes, but that this strikes at people's most fundamental sense of who they are. If you have been taught that this is your God, when your God is insulted, you are as deeply offended and hurt as you could be. And so... The, the, the way that people react in the West to questioning the orthodoxies of the pride movement is exactly parable to ha parallel sorry, to how people react in Muslim countries to perceived insults to the Prophet Muhammad. That wasn't me genuinely claiming him to be a prophet before anyone accused me of saying that, what they would perceive as a Prophet Muhammad. It is, it's the same phenomenon. When your gods whom you worship are insulted, you feel that your very self has been assaulted. And I think that we can go a little bit deeper than that and to say that um, uh, th this, I think, explains why there is such a deep instability to how individuals feel about themselves in our culture. It's often noticed, isn't it? Why is it that people can't just have a, a polite disagreement today? 
and instead have to take offense at everything. Well, this is the reason why, um, is that when you've been taught to worship yourself, if someone questions the things that, you're, that you in yourself believe, you haven't now just met someone who disagrees with you, you've met someone who has blasphemed your God. And that's an entirely different thing, isn't it? That's an entirely different thing. Now, um, what else? I'll, I'll, I'll go through these slightly more, um, uh, slightly more quickly. Um, I, I think it also explains why, um, why you can't have the LGB without the T. You can't have the uh, you, you can't have the sexuality issues without the gender identity issues, because you, you can't maintain that there is uh, this. Uh, the, the, let me get this clear. You, you can't maintain that sex, as in the noun, uh, male and female, really exists, but deny that it has any meaning, which is what uh, which is what the LGB thing has done. Okay, so for years and years we've been told, whether you're male or female means nothing. It means nothing. It has no significance. All that matters is who you feel attracted to. Okay, that, that's what we've been told for years and years and years. But if you deny that something means nothing, eventually someone's going to pop up and say, well, then it is nothing. It is nothing. Um, and uh, which, of course, is exactly what transgenderism has done. And has said that if, if your feelings about who you're attracted to define you, why don't your feelings about who you think you are define you? You can't have one for the other without the other. Uh, it, trying, uh, and that's quite important at the moment because, of course, there's, there's quite a lot of people around who are very, very unhappy with what is being done in the name of transgenderism and are thinking that we can take a step back to safety by saying, let's stop with the sexuality stuff. Let's have the LGB without the T. And we need as Christians to observe, no, no, if we've understood what is going on here, that will never be possible. If you worship the self, you will get all of them, and you will get more letters down the track that we haven't got to yet. But you can't stop this train by saying, we'll just have some of these kind of identities. It's the worship of the self that is everything. Um, now then... What then is the answer to this? And how should we respond? How do we respond to this as Christians in our world? What is the answer? Um, um, if there's one take home thing I think from this lecture I want to him, him, uh, urge upon us all is we don't need to panic. The answer is the gospel of Christ as it has been in every single generation. The answer is the gospel of Christ because the gospel of Christ is always about turning to the living God from idols. Uh, that's what it's been about in every generation. It's what it's been about in every nation where the gospel has come to. What does Jesus say? Mark 8, 34 to 35. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. To become a Christian is to die to self. It is to refuse to worship the self. Now, if there is something about our culture which is, which is new, it is the way that have, by making an idol of the self, what we've kind of done is sort of cut out the middleman. All idols are really about the self. All idols are really about projecting onto this thing that we made, the things we would rather God had said, but he didn't actually say. But what the West has done, because in the Enlightenment there was a particular desire to specifically reject the Christian inheritance of Europe and the Christian teaching that we, uh, that, that we have been brought up with, uh, it's as if we've kind of gone for idolatry in its purest form. We won't bother with kind of trying to kind of veil and, and disguise the desires of myself under the form of this invented idol, Artemis of the Ephesians or whoever it is. Um, and we're just going to worship ourselves directly. Um, uh, and that, if you like, that is the thing that is perhaps m most distinct about our culture. So therefore, when Jesus calls us to d deny yourself, um, 
he's been saying the same thing really to, uh, to every culture on earth. No matter who you worship, you have to turn from that idol because the idol was really about yourself and you have to turn to the living God and find in his incarnate son, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins uh, and uh, rescue from their power. And that is exactly the same message in our culture too. We're calling people to deny self, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Indeed, uh, in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus says those words, uh, it isn't just that we're following him to the cross, but he has just announced he's going to the cross and then will rise again. And the whole of Christian life, and Paul brings this out uh, deeply in Romans, in Romans uh, chapter 6, among other places, uh, that the Christian life, to become a Christian, is about dying and rising again with Christ. And the death that we experience in our conversion to Christ is a death to self. It is an end to pursuing self. It is an end to worshipping the false gods that we've worshipped, which were always a veiled excuse for following ourselves. But when we die, and it does feel like death to turn away from the gods whom we've inherited from our forefathers, when we die... In the name of Christ, he raises us to new life. And as those given new life, we are raised as those who are true images of God, restored to be worshippers of God. And that, of course, is exactly the gospel we need, isn't it? It is precisely what every person in our self-worshipping culture needs to hear. You've got to stop worshipping yourself and start worshipping God. Now, that is extremely offensive to people. But we should not think that that is unusual. The apostles in Acts are repeatedly uh, repeatedly, um, uh, hated, driven out of cities, even stoned, um, because they were calling people to turn from their idols. And no one takes that lightly. Indeed, apart from the work of the Spirit, uh, that is something which will always be hated. But by God's grace, under the work of the Spirit, it is also the route to life and salvation. The reason that many Christians of our generation are so troubled by the hostility which we, it seems, rather suddenly find ourselves under is because, well, it, it feels new to us, but it's only new to us because of the peculiarity of our current uh, uh, history situation in that we are coming out of a nation that for a thousand years was broadly and deeply Christian. doesn't mean everyone was converted, but the basic assumptions of society were. But that was the unusual thing, not what we face now. And the gospel is, as always, die to self, be raised with Christ. Therefore, that is why Peter said, do not be conformed to your passions, to the passions of your flesh, but as he who called you is holy, so you should be holy in all you do. We should be holy as God is holy. That has always been the Christian answer to these things. By the way, as an aside, I hope you can kind of see from all this that... um, when people talk about the issues of homosexuality and transgenderism and say things like, well, the Bible only very rarely addresses them, um, or uh, this isn't really a major concern of Scripture because it's only here in these few verses and some of them are in Leviticus and we don't read Leviticus anyway. Um, uh, well, I hope you can see that that, is, that that entirely is missing what is going on here. There is no more fundamental truth to the gospel than the turning away from self towards Christ, from the denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Christ. I, um, I had an amusing interaction once a number of years ago um, when uh, I was doing some very short-term study in Edinburgh, um, which required me to visit Edinburgh University Library, and I um, was walking across the square in front, of, uh, in front of the University Library, and I was stopped by a student with a clipboard who said, would you like to sign our petition? And I said, well, what is your petition? And she said, um, uh, it's against the Christian Union. 
to each other, well, this is, this is amusing. Let's see where this goes. So I said, okay, why do you have a petition against the Christian Union? And she said, well, she said, it's because uh, they are, uh, some of you may remember this, that they're, they're running a, a course um, which is called Pure. I think it was just called Pure, um, uh, which, is, which is about sex. And I said, okay, well, why is that a bad thing? Um, and I said, well, it's because that they're asking gay people to deny who they really are. And I said, and I said, well, actually, the really, this is the sad bit of the story is that I don't remember what I said next, but I didn't sign the petition. But afterwards, I thought to myself what I wish I had said, uh, which is that I wish I'd said, but that's what Jesus says to everyone, to deny who you think you really are. That just is the gospel. When you encounter Christ, he doesn't he doesn't kind of make you feel nice, happy thoughts about yourselves. God sent his son to redeem you, to bring you to the grave, to ask you to take up your cross and follow him, which is not a description of enduring a few hardships in life. To take up your cross is because you're going to be nailed to it. To be a Christian is to walk to your grave following Jesus Christ, knowing that he will raise you to true eternal life, knowing that he will remake you as what you have always been supposed to be. That's why in, uh, in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, uh, Paul, Paul d- describes those who have come to Christ and calls his hearers in a letter to, um, uh, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to put on the new self, made to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That is what the the gospel is all about. Now, what I want to do is then to apply some of this to ourselves. Um, uh, Here perhaps is the most controversial thing I shall say this evening. I don't know whether that's true. That's a risky thing to say. I might outdo myself before the evening's done. But anyway... um, If you've been thinking, yes, all that LGBT stuff is really bad, um, and um, thankfully it doesn't apply to me because I'm a heterosexual, I'm going to say pretty bluntly, that is saying the same thing. We are not defined by our lusts. And when people say the word heterosexual, what they're actually doing is in a really quite unpleasant way, what we all do if we do it, is to roll together the goodness of marital union of a man and a woman with what is a whole basket of very unclean lusts in the Bible. They are not the same thing. We all have corrupted sexual desires in our hearts, and there is no place for Christians to define ourselves by the desires of our hearts. Not our sinful desires anyway. We do, of course, once God has redeemed us, learn to define ourselves by our new desire to love God and to love others for God's sake. So I do therefore want to say that the first place to start in all of this is to repent ourselves. It's very easy for us to think, well, bad things are being done in our culture, and that's a bad thing. Well, it is true, bad things are being done, and it is a bad thing, and we should definitely call them out. And yet, we need to recognise how deeply implicated so many of us are. You see, the whole discourse of individual freedom and the obsession with the individual being able to define who we are is something that, as Christians, we are often deeply implicated in. And we love to, uh, to, to think of ourselves as fundamentally free people who have chosen to be Christians. And we really mustn't do that. We really mustn't do that. Who we are is images of God whom the living God has chosen to redeem by his grace. And under that is where we should know who we, how, how we should call ourselves. Therefore, I do want to urge ourselves to, let, let's not buy into this thing at all. Don't be LGBT, don't be H either. Be a man or woman who knows that you are made in the image of God and redeemed to be 
a renewed image of God. So we need to, therefore, make sure that we repent of our own sins. And let me kind of work out, how does this then apply, particularly in this whole area? Uh, I hope, therefore, from what I've just said, that in what I'm going to say, I'm not making any assumptions about uh, what is going on in each of our hearts in this room in terms of what our particular uh, what our particular temptations, desires, lusts, sexual and otherwise, might be. And there is no place at all for any of us to think that we are somehow superior because there is one species of corrupted human desire which we ourselves don't indulge in. Uh, it's very important that we don't do that. Now, what every Christian in every way needs to do is, well, first of all, repent of our sins, repent of the ways in which we have followed our sinful hearts. But we must go deeper than that and repent of our sinful desires themselves. This is something which is abundantly clear in Scripture and is also uh, universally um, uh, stated in all of the Reformed confessions uh, and all of the Reformation statements of faith made very clear that sin lies not principally in your hands, nor does it even lie principally in your thoughts. It lies principally in your desires. It is in the wanting to sin that the true offence of sin to God lies. Uh, that is, if you're interested in such things, uh, known to, by theologians as concupiscence. Um, the reason it's given such a crazy name is partly because theologians like to pretend they understand Latin, um, but partly because it helpfully distinguishes between, it's not, that's not talking about mental sins, mental acts. There is such a thing as a sin you can commit in your head. You can imagine yourself going and banging your neighbour on the head with a shovel or something uh, without doing it, and that is a sinful thing to do, as Jesus said. Um, and, uh, but, but actually, that's not what we're talking about here. Rather, it is, the, it is the fact that the desire to hit my neighbour on the head with a shovel pops... You're going to worry about me now, aren't you? I love my neighbours. going very well with them. But, um, uh, it is the des- it's the fact that the desire to sin bubbles up in my heart unbidden... That is the principal place that my offensiveness as a sinner to God lies. It is in the corruptions of our hearts that we have most offended God because sin is not principally about what I have done. It's principally about what I am. Now, that is really very profoundly important. That's why Prophet Joel says things like, Tear your hearts and not your garments. That's why Psalm 51, David, uh, in his great penitential psalm, um, says, uh, says it, 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 I, am, I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Uh, and he says, uh, it is, uh, it, I, I have sinned against you. Uh, the point about recognizing that sin lies in our desires is saying it's not someone else's fault. Why did you sin? And the awful truth is because you wanted to sin. It's true of all of us. So repentance must be of our desires themselves. And that is true of all of us. Now, it's very easy for us to want to, uh, to try to um, wriggle out of some of the offensiveness of the gospel by saying, um, as long as you don't act on things, then it's fine. You're fine as you are. But that isn't true for any of us. And where that leads us to this is that we must repent of identifying ourselves by our desires. Why is it a sin to identify yourself by your desires? The answer to that is that uh, it is giving an importance to your desires that they don't have. Or if I can put that more simply, it's giving an importance to yourself that you do not have. Or if I can put that more simply, you're worshipping yourself. Yeah. And therefore, for every, uh, for every person who comes to Christ in today's culture, one of the prime points of repentance, in a sense the prime point of repentance, is, uh, is to repent of ever thinking that my desires defined me. 
No, they don't. Very, I regularly get asked, is it, is it a sin to be gay? My answer to that question is always, that is a, that is a non-question for a Christian. I can't answer it because, uh, because as a Christian, I don't see any, uh, that there's any value or any significance in, in identifying people as gay. But what I would say is this, it is a sin to identify yourself as gay. It is a sin to believe that that is who you are. Just as it is a sin to be proud of your heterosexual lusts. Just as it's a sin to be proud in your pride, to be proud of your achievements. Just as it is a sin to be greedy. You see, to identify ourselves by these things places a significance upon them that they don't have. So I, I, now this is therefore is um, pastorally very, very significant. Very, very, very significant. Um, Both is it helps to shape what repentance looks like. It is all about saying, I am not defined by my desires. That's not who I am. I used to worship that and worship myself. I don't anymore. Um, It also actually is is enormously good news. It is hugely good news. And in a way, it is here, I think, that we are enabled to see the kind of value for this in preaching the gospel In all of our churches, we will, from this point on, and I'm sure it's already happening, regularly be having people come to our churches who have been ruined by the belief that who they are is defined by their feelings. Uh, And when I say ruined, of course, sometimes that will be obvious. Um, We uh, relatively, uh, well, regularly is probably too often, but is beginning to become unsurprising when, uh, when people come to our church now in York um, who are clearly men who are trying to become women or women who are trying to become men. Um, and often in those situations, they already arrive with bodies that are drastically damaged and probably beyond what can ever be repaired in this life, though thankfully not, of course, at the resurrection uh, where all things will be put right. Um, so sometimes it will be obvious but in huge numbers of other times, it will be entirely invisible. Um, so that will, of course, be those who come to church who, because of this belief in the, in the worship of the self, um, believe themselves to be one of these identities. It's actually becoming incredibly common, um, uh, particularly amongst young women. Uh, not only it gets lots of publicity, the fact that amongst young women there's a very, very high rate, uh, highly increased rate of um, gender dysphoria, but also the huge numbers who are now identifying themselves as bisexual. Um, is ve- we need to just assume that people are going to come to our churches just believing these things because that's what they've been taught. Uh, they've been taught that yourself comes first, etc. And that, of course, carries with it huge collateral damage. It carries with it huge collateral damage um, because of uh, because of where, the way it leads people to behave, you must fulfill this in order to be truly human, which opens people up to all sorts of dreadful and shameful uh, sexual experiences and in many, many cases, sexual abuse, of course, because all of the defences have been taken down. But we need also to push wider and to say that this is not just an LGBT, etc. issue. It is an H issue as well for the same message that has been taught particularly uh, to those who are, uh, you know, who've been to school in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, um, uh, have all been taught that your sexual experiences are the gateway to finding your true self. You must discern who you are and then act upon it. And so we have people who are deeply shamed, believing a truth about themselves that is deeply at variance with the body that God gave them, um, and uh, and fundamentally, deeply, personally dislocate it. Because, of course, idolatry always teaches lies. Artemis did not, in fact, fall from the sky in Ephesus. Um, And there is no real God of the self. And in a culture where people have been taught that there is and you must serve it, people are walking around with a deep kind of vacuum 
in their hearts for what actually it really means to be who they are and have been pursuing a reality that does not exist and suffering in all sorts of ways. But the sweet good news of the gospel is that Christ comes to set us free from all of that. And Christ comes to say to every man, woman, and child, you are not a servant of Artemis. You are not a servant of the Baals. You are not fundamentally a Muslim. And you are not a slave of your sexual feelings. You are not created by this mysterious inner self. No, you're made by the one true holy God for himself who sent his son to redeem you. And in him, you can be and you will be restored to who you really are. Now, we need to believe that that gospel is exactly what our world needs. We need to believe that very profoundly. Uh, I think we often need to repent of not really believing it. I think many of us have been walking around for the last 20 years with this sort of niggling sense that the gospel is quite bad news for gay people. Or the gospel is quite bad news for most modern people. Um, And so we know what we should say, but we say it slightly begrudgingly. Brothers and sisters, Christ is not bad news. Christ is the freedom that people need to be saved from these things. So then, let me try and draw these threads together to finish. Um, um, How then do we proclaim this to the world? Well, I've been trying to to spread that out. The key thing is we believe that the gospel is good news because sin is really bad. And we need to believe that God's commands are good. Um, uh, In the last few weeks, um, I've been working with another, uh, a group of Uh, ministers from around the country and from different denominations to produce a statement, a very hopefully fairly simple statement on marriage, which simply sets out why marriage is good, why the Christian doctrine of uh, chastity, that is abstinence outside marriage and faithfulness within it, is just good, why it's good for people. It is really good. It's called the Greater Love Declaration. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you very much to go and look it up. Uh, You you can Google that and find it. Um, And you can sign it as well, which would be a great thing. We'd love to have as many signatures as possible. Um, so, uh, but I think we need to deeply work that into our own hearts to believe that the gospel is good, God's commands are good, God's design is good, uh, and what God does in Christ is to set us free from the slavery of sin, to turn us from idols to the living God. Um, and uh, and if, if, we, if we do that unashamedly, then, well, people will be saved. The gospel is good news to sinners. Now, we will not be able to do that without cost. We, we really will not. I definitely grew up um, uh, at a stage when everyone thought Christianity was weird, but also everyone thought it was harmless. Um, and so I've, we got very used to when I, you know, in my sort of youth group days and student days of, of you know, really praying for courage that we'd endure the cost of being a Christian. And what we really meant was we'd endure the embarrassment of the kind of things people would say about us in the college bar um, or whatever. Um, uh, we're not there anymore, are we? That there is no faithfulness on this issue that will come to us without suffering. But that's okay. Because our Lord went to the cross and he taught us to expect that they will do the same to us. Um, And uh, we do need to be a generation of Christians who become far more, dare I say, comfortable with persecution. I don't think many of us are likely to get thrown to the lions. Um, uh, But it doesn't mean that losing your job isn't a very bad thing. Um, Or having threat of having your children taken away isn't a very bad thing. Um, And uh, we we are going to have to steel ourselves for that but particularly to believe that the goodness of Christ, the goodness of the gospel for sinners, makes it worth it. I've got one more thing to say, which is is this. Where did it all go wrong? Where did it all go wrong? Well, of course, in a sense, in the Garden of Eden is the answer to that question. But if we think about it for ourselves, and particularly in... You know, in, uh, in a nation that once was very clearly confessionally Christian, um, of course, it's always been 
masses of sin and masses of unbelief and not pretending that there was ever a golden age when everyone believed it. But nevertheless, so, you know, things have changed. Where did it all go wrong? And, and in one sense, the answer is this. The issue is all about worship. To be an image of God is to worship the true God. And the falsehoods which we're living with about sexual and gender identity are a, are a fruit of false worship. And we will not put this right in our own lives, or amongst our own families and those whom we know, without reinstating the centrality of the worship of the triune God. And one mistake that we as Christians could definitely make would be to, to talk about uh, what we believe about these things without talking about the worship of God as being central. And if we ourselves would be those who want to flee as far as we can from the idolatry of the self, let's be those who put the worship of God with his church on the Lord's day, with our families where God has blessed us with them, and on our own whenever we have opportunity as the central feature of our lives. We're made to worship God, and that is who we truly are. Thank you. Good place to end? Yeah, great place. Um, appreciate you very much uh, dealing with it. one of the toughest issues there, there is in today's society. Um, we're going to have a time of questions now, and Angie and James will be roving around with microphones. Uh, put your hand in the air, and when I call you, um, say your name. Yes, John. And then Ellen. <coughs> Well, first of all, Matthew, thank you. I found that brilliantly incisive. Um, my question is a hard one, and, um, but it's a real one and one that I've been grappling with. If we project this into the future, there are, there are some who expect this to collapse under its own weight mm -hmm. and who would say, we've got great grounds for optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, there are others who say, no, as Christians, we need to see ourselves as a small and relatively beleaguered minority and take comfort in Christian community. <laughs> what, what is your view uh, about the future? Uh, my view about the future is that um, <clears throat> Christ will return and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, oh, that, that's got to be our controlling view of the future, isn't it? Is that um, all of history is the history of the glorification of Christ and his ultimate marriage to his church. So um, Christians never have cause to panic. We never have cause to panic. Um, and there's been, I think, we've, I think we've done quite a lot of low-level panicking over this issue over the last 30 years, I think. It's just kind of, kind of oh, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And um, then panic, like Christ is Lord. So that, well, that's, the, that's the kind of overarching answer. Let me answer, really answer your question, because I know you know that. Um, is this likely to collapse under its own weight? Um, yes, it will, because it is, of course, nonsense. But... I don't think that that in itself is grounds for optimism. When, when human structures collapse under their own weight, the result is not nice, happy, peaceful outcomes. What, what happens is you get anarchy with lots and lots of people even more wounded. Um, and in a sense, we, we are living through its collapse under its own weight. Okay? The transgenderism is the collapse of the, uh, what has been up till now, the homosexual movement, um, under its own weight. Um, it's very interesting, I don't have time to talk about this, but um, Judith Butler, who is the, the big apologist for transgenderism, in her book, Gender Trouble, um, which is about the most incomprehensible book you'll ever try and read. Uh, but she does, just read the introduction, because that sums it up quite neatly. Um, uh, that, but, but one of the things that, that she, she identifies absolutely accurately, actually, is that you cannot believe that, um, exactly what I said earlier on, you cannot believe that sex means nothing, but say it still is something. And so if there is to be true sexual liberation, you have to stop saying that there is a reality to male and female, because if so, you, you basically uh, are left saying there is some real distinction between <coughs> having sex with someone of the same sex or someone of the opposite sex, right? And, and so we can't have that, and that's why we've got to do it. Now, um, Therefore, what transgenderism is, it, it is the fruit of 
this, uh, of the movement as we've seen it so far. And it is, of course, deeply, horribly ugly with children mutilating and poisoning their bodies um, and, uh, and ju just the, the extreme distastefulness of everything that's involved in it. So we're watching it collapse, but that is not a pretty thing. Now, where is this going to go? It's gonna, it is going to collapse, but it will collapse in some horrible ways. And you don't have to think very long before you think, if we have elevated the sexual desires of the self to the, to the level of a deity which must be served, then that leads in a lot of places that aren't yet in the list of letters. But, but they definitely will be for some, and, uh, and the list will keep getting longer even if people don't use it. So I think it will collapse, but we shouldn't take hope in that. I think we should take hope in the fact that Christ is Lord, and he works in every culture to, do, to work out his purposes. And where the gospel is preached, he honors his name, um, he honours his name sometimes in the sal well, partly in the salvation of uh, of the elect, and partly in the in the in the destruction of the wicked. And we don't know whether it is God's plan that in our nation, which has been greatly blessed in the past, uh, that crushing judgment may be what He brings. If He does, well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, at the same time, it may be that He chooses to bring real return to the, to, uh, to salvation. Well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, well, it certainly happens that there will be some of both. Um, so I haven't really answered your question, but let's be confident in the proclamation of the gospel. Right, Alan. Uh, yeah, again, just to say thanks very much. That's very clear and helpful. I just wanted to seek clarification on what we might call the civil war within the LGBT mm -hmm. kind of yeah. movement. And yeah. you seemed, I may have misunderstood, you seemed to say that sort of historic homosexuality was rooted in sexual attractiveness rather than in identity and that therefore the trans have come along and kind of challenged that position. Whereas I would say that historic homosexuality was rooted in an identity, that they, say, they would argue it was hardwired and not a lifestyle choice and so on, and that the trans have ever challenged that in a different way. But I may have misunderstood what you were saying. Uh, yes, I think perhaps you did. I, I was meaning more the closer to the second one. Um, uh, what, what I think I did say is there has been, um, there has been, uh, homosexual sex and attraction and lust in every age of the earth. But the idea that that establishes an identity is very definitely one which is only found in, uh, in post-enlightenment ex-Christian cultures where the self has been uh, elevated in this sense. So no, I am absolutely agreeing with you, with you that what, really what I'm saying is there is no very deep distinction between transgenderism and the rest of the LGB thing, actually, despite what, what a number of second wave feminists want to argue right now, is there is no very deep distinction because, um, uh, because, because what, the, both share the same conviction about identity, um, that you must, uh, yeah, that, that who, you are who you are is defined by how you feel. That's been embedded in the, the pride movement, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, since, its in, since its inception as we know it back in the 60s and 70s. Um, but it was, frankly, that was, that's not where it was, it didn't, um, the whole LGBT thing is just one particularly clear outgrowth of the much wider thing of, of the way that sex has been conceived in post-Christian Europe, which is that it has been elevated to this thing of that it is all about your identity. Um, now it is true within the the kind of queer theory movement, there have been a number of voices all the way through who, who are more driven by libertarianism, we should just be true to cho choose who we sleep with, than are driven by the identity thing. Having said that, I, I would very much want to say that that's really just a difference of species. One kind of puts self as the idol and one puts freedom as the idol, but they're very interchangeable things. Um, and really, freedom is the freedom of the self and self is all about the self being unconstrained by other things. So I don't think they're as different as they think they are. But, but no, I, I was more saying your second thing. Um, yeah, thank you um, for a, a very interesting uh, talk. Um, I, I wonder to what extent uh, think things started to happen right way back in the beginning. Well, um, of course, when Eve sin uh, and Adam sinned, um, and uh, one of the early chapters of Genesis, God's heart was filled with pain and, and he sort of repented of creating man and that led to the flood. Um, 
but um, Britain has been a Christian nation, uh, as, as you rightly said, uh, for all of its life, and nearly all of its um, laws are based on, on, on the Bible. Um, and when, when we had World War II, King George VI um, called the nation to prayer uh, seven times indeed, and, and without that prayer we wouldn't have won the war. Um, but the interesting thing is, and this is where I, I'd like your opinion, um, did the rot set in in 1950 when, when the government started passing laws which were anti-biblical? 1950 started off repealing the law of blasphemy and the law of um, uh, uh, law of witchcraft. Yes, yes. Thank you, Pet. Um, and and it, there's been a whole raft of anti anti biblical laws uh, since then. Of course, with was it 1967 or somewhere around there, uh, decriminalising. Um, uh, so, so has that opened the floodgates? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. That's a, a, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, certainly, when did the rot set in in the Garden of Eden? We should be very clear about that. Um, that there's the, there's a, there is a very important sense in which um, we, shouldn't, I, we shouldn't see our age as being unusual in its wickedness, <laughs> in that wickedness is endemic in every age, and Christ has come to redeem us from all our wickedness. And uh, it's quite... It, it, it's quite useful to, um, to just kind of remind ourselves of just how dark the world was before Christ came into it and the, the, the nature, what it was like to live in the Roman Empire. I mean, at school, you always imagine how great it was to be a Roman. And, you know, they had their mosaics and their wine and their soldiers and stuff. It was horrific to live in the Roman Empire, particularly if you were a slave or a woman or, or both, or worst of all. Um, and, and Christ dramatically transformed it. Um, uh, and yet even in the most deepest levels of, of Christian transformation of society, net, the evils of society were still manifest and, and, and uh, manifold, I should say, and, and very deep still. So we want to be just careful about that. Um, uh, in terms of the way it's unfolded in the West, um, certainly it is true that the, basically what the Second World War did was to give us a new vision of the devil, basically. We could get rid of the devil and just have Hitler instead. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, a, there's been an awful lot of what has happened since the war of, of this bizarre increased confidence that we don't need God in order to, in order to establish righteousness, because all we've got to do is try and be as unlike Hitler as possible. Um, but actually, that, all that really is happening is something that was, has been going on in European society uh, since the 17th century. Uh, there's, uh, there's nothing which is being said by the most, if I can use the word, progressive people today, which actually you cannot find on the lips of philosophers in the 1800s and 1700s. Um, and it's much more that what happened since the Second World War has, has just been that the rot that was kind of pretty, very deeply embedded, but below the surface, has, has reached the surface of society. Um, and it, it's rather more that. Um, but there's loads of things we could say about that and probably we ought to be as humble as possible as Christians and saying a big part of that is the failure of the church to preach the gospel of Christ clearly and consistently. Um, so that's what we can do about it is preach. Right. I think it was, was it Chris Richards? <coughs> Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I have an evangelistic question, which is as we point people to Christ, mm -hmm. how helpful, helpful is it to to point out to people who worship themselves that they do worship themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's very helpful. Um, I mean, in one way, I think it's in sense the thing that we need to be talking about most um, is, is, to, uh, is to say, look, the, or could I put it this way? Um, uh, when we encounter people, as we all will, particularly you know, if, if, if we're in Christian churches, I really hope we are expecting people who will come along who will identify themselves as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, because we want sinners to come to church, right? We really do. Um, and, uh, but wh when we do that, what do we want to say to them? Is the first thing to say, look, your real problem is that you are engaging in immoral sexual activity. 
Is that where we start? And I think the answer I think I want to say is no. I certainly think we should hide that. But the reason we don't start there is that actually isn't the most serious sin they're committing. I'm not saying it isn't very serious. I'm just saying that the, the deep underlying sin is the idolatry of the self. And actually that's something that we as Christians are uniquely positioned to engage with and to expose, precisely because it's where Christ points us directly. Um, and, uh, and I think we, we need to have greater confidence in that, really, is that to say to people, okay, when someone says, as this happens relatively regularly at our church, um, uh, yes, well, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a lesbian or I'm bisexual, um, uh, you know, do, does that mean, you know, can I come to your church? What does God think of me, et cetera? Um, and my answer to that would, would be to start by saying, um, we don't think of you that way. Um, you, we don't think you are defined by yourself in that way. Um, and actually, you don't need to think that either. But you, you've been made by the God of infinite holiness to be an image of his glory and to reflect that in the world. You are a far greater creature than you have ever imagined. Um, and uh, and the, to identify yourself the way you just have to me is, is something that, that I don't want to do that because I think that really denigrates you. Um, you're not defined by yourself. And I want to really encourage you to stop looking inside to find the truth um, and to find who you really are. And I want to introduce you to the God who made you and who calls you again to know who you really are. Um, and I've had those kind of conversations with a number of people. And of course, sometimes they disappear and sometimes they don't. Um, uh, but I think, we, that's the, I think it's evangelistically very helpful to point out the, the deep self-centeredness of this um, and the glory of Christian God-centeredness and self-sacrifice in comparison. Thanks, Chris. Great. Now, we're in injury time. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now, because there's a flip side. While Angus walks forward, he's going to mention your books. Oh, is it? Oh, great. So you wanted to be plugged. That so we have. There is a flip side. Mm -hmm. There are other churches, probably not from the sort of churches we go to here, yeah. where some people say, oh, come to Christ. And then, you know, we can talk about those things afterwards. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of churches like that, yeah. which I know that that's not your church. So how, what would you say to those sorts of churches? Yes, I, I probably want to make a bit of a distinction that, that even am, amongst churches that would say what you've said, I think there are two different things that may be going on. There are those churches who genuinely do want people to know the truth and genuinely do want people to repent and believe, but are, are just are saying that because they're, they're afraid of putting people off too quickly. And I have sympathy with that, even though I don't think it's the right approach. But I, I, well, I think that's a very different thing to those churches which are saying, come to Christ, and actually Christ will bless whatever sins you come with, um, which is, of course, is, a, is a, a dreadfully wicked inversion of the gospel. So I want to make that distinction. Um, so I think you're asking me about the first of those, the kind of well-meaning, but not... Is that right? Well, no, I... I, I, I would tend to meet the second. Okay, fine. So what do I think about... And that, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing. It, we, we, we need to be willing as Christians to be very clear on what the gospel is. But one thing I think would really help us would be this thing of genuinely believing that sin is bad and that God's ways are good. Um, and if we believe that, then it does help an awful lot because um, the, the problem with, and seeing as it's been in the news, let's go for what the Bishop of Oxford um, said last week, is... Um, one of the things he said is that, you know, you know we, we've been taught that there's something wrong with gay marriage, but I can't see it. Um, and one of the things we need to respond with is the damage that is done by this religion of the self is profound and awful. And if you, if you delete from human experience the reality of what it means to be made male and female in the image of God, which is what you have to do in order to believe in gay marriage. Indeed, if you, if you introduce instead the worship of the self, which is what you have to do to believe there is such a thing as gay marriage, what do you, where does that lead you? And the answer is it leads you to teenagers butchering their bodies. It leads you to, uh, to desperate um, uh, mental health issues of people who have no idea who they really are. It leads to abusive situations because it leads to all the horrific sexualization of children that is done in the name of this religion, uh, which uh, thankfully a few people have started to, uh, to speak about more openly recently. Uh, it leads to profound dislocation in people's hearts where who they think they are is, is in opposition to their bodies. 
and it leads to uh, the enormous damage that sexual promiscuity does to people. Those are real serious harms. Um, and, uh, and it's part of Christian love to point people to the goodness of Christ. And so um, we, we are going to have to be ready to be pretty bold and say real Christianity doesn't do that. Uh, real Christianity looks to Christ who laid down his life for his friends and says to be a Christian is not to pursue the satisfaction of self, it's to deny self for the sake of God and for others. And where, Christ, where, where people claim to be Christians but don't believe that, we're just going to say, sorry, that's not the real thing.